So, we're looking at words for the word in Psalm number 119. Psalm number 119. And uh, we started this morning with law, and we're going to perhaps finish this afternoon with law. I think that that's the case anyway, that we'll probably get through the end of that. There are other things to discuss and other things to look at that are part of this word in that psalm that is quite useful. Somebody pointed out that this chart is difficult, uh, which is a good point. These are supposed to be verse number, and basically I was fighting with the headers in the table. Um, they, it wouldn't play nice. It kept changing the size of the chart, and you couldn't see it, but the words... Law, testimonies, precepts, statutes, commandments, and rules are different rules, or I'm sorry, different words, all of which refer to basically the Bible in some form. And they occur in Psalm number 119. Their first occurrence is cited here in verse format. So the first verse of Psalm 119 is where the word for law occurs, our current word, Torah. The next word occurs in the second verse, that is testimonies. The next word we'll look at will be precepts, and that is occurring in verse 4 for the first time. But they actually, all of them occur and recur in Psalm 119 many times over. So this is just their first, uh, where we first come across them in Psalm 119. And really the point of this chart is, uh, well, that there are, Uh, you know, no fewer than a half dozen different words here for the word of God, and that they all occur within the first stanza, Aleph, and they occur over and over through the psalm. So it's telling us uh, something about how it is that we want to conduct this study, and uh, you may remember that we talked a little bit about method over there, citing Genesis 26.5, where we have the voice of the Lord, the charge of the Lord, the commandments, the statutes, and the laws of the Lord. That tells you that these words occurring side by side like that are not intended to mean the same thing. Otherwise, you would just use one word. But that's not what God did. That tells us that he means for us to pick up what the compare and contrast is between the terms. So that's the rationale for pursuing the study in the way that we are doing it, you know, without getting too far afield, but just a little bit of a reminder. And again, the first verse is the first occurrence of the first word, Torah, the law. Psalm 119, verse 1, blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Beneath that is noted a Strong's number, H8451. You can go to blueletterbible.org and learn all of the fun and and uh, interesting and enlightening things that you can do with a Strong's number. But uh, we won't talk about that at the moment. Perhaps later, if somebody has questions about that or wants to... Uh, See more about that method, how you chase that down. I'd be happy to show you. It's very useful to let the Bible define its own terms by means of Strong's numbers. The last thing that we talked about from the first part of the lesson this morning was that the law is publicly accessible It's written on very large stones on Mount Ebal as you enter the promised land and written in such a way that it's, uh, well, there's plaster. So it's high contrast, large letters, very clear, easy for people to read it when they walk by. It's there for public consumption, for Israel to walk out and read the law for themselves if they so desire and for visitors to the land to come in, and first thing they see is the law of God, writ large, quite literally, on the mount, on the way in. That's a wonderful thing, and is a very good thing for us to um, copy in our own lives. Um, But let's continue from there, talking about the law a little bit more, This time we'll talk about the fact that when God establishes an authority, 
whether that be a priest or a king or whatever it is, a father in a household, that authority is intended to further the purposes of the law, to spread the law to those who are under their authority. That's always the case. You're intended to use what God puts into your hand to serve God with. All right, so we look at Deuteronomy 17 and find that in this text, which predates the establishment of a king, but it anticipates that it's coming. The time is coming when they're going to have one, and when they do, there are already rules in place for this king to follow. Deuteronomy 17 shows us that it is the king's job to transmit the text of the Bible. 17th chapter, verse 15, You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. And skip down to the 18th verse, When he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes, and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Well, that's the end of that for now. That's what we're reading here. But the king is vested with authority, and he uses that authority to copy the word of God. Now, it's interesting in the, in the 18th verse, the copy is for himself. It tells us he's supposed to be dedicated to the word of God. He's supposed to have a copy that he can read. He doesn't have to leave his home or the, you know, the place where they are. Uh, to be able to read the law up there on Mount Ebal. He has a copy with him. And this copy is approved by the Levitical priests, which is to say, he's not allowed to change it, to amend it or emend it. <laughs> he can add nothing, he can take nothing, add nothing to it, take nothing from it. It has to be the real, authentic word of God. A copy, but the real thing. Well, this is very interesting if you consider authority in the fact that we are vested with authority from time to time. Whether that be that you yourself are your own person and you can get for yourself a copy of the Bible... You have choices about your life, about what you will do, what you will not do, where you will spend your resources, your time, your energy, and where you will not spend those things, or whether that be that you actually have some kind of authority. You are perhaps a head of household, or you are an officer in the church of the Lord. What do you do with that authority today? If the king in the kingdom of God was governed by God's law in this way, you know, how ought you and I to be governed in terms of the authority of the word of God in our lives when we are vested with authority? Should we share that word of God with those who are under our authority? Should we share that word of God in the circles of our, or rather the spheres of our influence by the authority that God has granted to our hands? I dare say that's not a difficult conclusion. And in the 19th verse, 19th verse, Deuteronomy 17, 19, it shall be with him, he shall read in it all the days of his life. So it has to be a habit has to go with you. Now, I understand that, you know, maybe you could be found at some point in time without a Bible on your person. Yeah, but 
the word is with you in your heart, in your mind. You think about God's word. You think about God's things, the people of God. It's with you. And you read in this book all the days of your life because it fills your heart you know, with the proper love for the neighbor and it fills your mind and soul with the knowledge of what is right and wrong, with the justice of God that allows you to make good decisions in life, good choices. And the other thing that happens if you are dedicated to the word as the standard and you're holding yourself to this objective third-party standard, which is the word of God, is that your heart is not lifted up above your brother's. Even if you are given some kind of authority, say you are an evangelist or say you are an elder in the Lord's church, you don't lord that over others. You do not uh, fiat declare your will and impose that upon the brethren. Rather, you use the word of God and not turn aside from the commandment, whether to the right or the left, the result of that is to continue long in God's service and to bless your own children. That is, those who are in your charge are blessed when you are faithful, when you faithfully discharge your duties. And yes, if you're a father, then yeah, your children will be affected by that. You're going to see the, some of these children will become Christians themselves. So yeah, the question, what do you do with authority today? Seems fairly obvious. If that was what the king was required to do, so much more you and me. Even if your authority extends only to your own life, your own choices. As an American, you have considerable freedom. You have considerable availability of resources. Things that cannot just be gotten in every country. Bibles are hard to come by in some places, you know. The ability to worship without fear of government interference or worse is not easy to come by in some places like Nigeria. And there are others, and there always have been, and there always will be. So take to heart the fact that this is some measure of authority, some measure of choice that has been granted to your hand, and you are supposed to use that for God's purpose. Okay? Good enough, I think. If you are thinking about how the king is intended to be the transmission mechanism for the text, you know, let my life also transmit a faithful copy of God's word through my lips, through my life, my example before others. Right? All right. The other thing you read there is in Deuteronomy 31 about priests who also are given authority, and their authority includes a commandment to them to read the law to the people. This is an interesting episode, but have a look with me. Deuteronomy 31, verse 2, he said... Moses did. I'm 120 years old today. I'm no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has told me, you will not go over this Jordan. In other words, Moses is going to die. He is not going to enter the promised land with them. They're about to be handed off to somebody else. So what does he do? Well, a few things, but in verse 9, we're looking at this. Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you will read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, children alike, 
even resident aliens within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the words of this law and so that their children who have not known it may hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you're going over the Jordan to possess. This is the commandment. It's every seven years at the Feast of Booths. If you're not familiar with the Feast of Booths, it should be tents. I don't know why they say booth instead of tent. Maybe they thought that was too intense. Anyone, anyone? No? No. All right. Hey, we're trying to see if anybody's still awake and paying attention, okay? Happens sometimes. I'm in the flesh too, you know. I know what it's like to be tired. <laughs> now, at the end of every seven years, there comes a time when they are in a festival, staying in tents, which shows that they're temporary dwellers, even in this promised land. That This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. That's what the Feast of Booths is all about. And we're the same way as Christians. We realize this world is not my home. This is not permanent. My citizenship, my eternal citizenship is in heaven. Here we have no abiding possession. At that time, when the people are in this mindset and they are assembled every seven years, then you remind them. You read the entire law in their hearing. And who are they? Well, it's everybody. Assemble the people, men, women, children, resident aliens, everybody who lives inside the borders of Israel must show up, that's assemble, and hear the entire law of the Lord read to them. Now, the king has a copy of this law. He's reading it daily, of course. The priests are re daily reading this law. If you go to the temple, you can go to Mount Ebal, where there's a copy of the law writ large that you can take in on your own time. But at this festival, every seven years, it is officially read to the entire nation. If you cannot travel, if you cannot get to Ebal, if you cannot read or write, at the very least, you're going to hear the law every seven years. The entire Bible. <clears throat> Which is to say, if you go with your children every seven years to the festival in Jerusalem, they're going to hear it about three times before they themselves reach the age that they can be parents to. If nothing else... They will hear the word, the entire Bible, at least three times before then. Everybody has a shot at knowing what God wants them to do, is the bottom line here. Which is why he brings in this idea that they will know it, and their children who haven't known it will come to hear and learn, and uh, learn to fear the Lord. That is the job of the priests and the elders of Israel. They have to be sure that this thing gets out there. So Moses is leaving, but the word is staying. Priests will also leave, but the word will stay. The people, of course, go through cycles like any human being in any human society, but every seven years at the Feast of Booths, if nothing else... You hear the entirety of the Bible every seven years. And I say, if nothing else, not as though that's good enough, uh, but to say, not everybody was free. <laughs> not everybody could get out. Not everybody could read. So it might be that that was your circumstance. That's possible. But at the very least, every seven years, you hear the entirety of God's word read to you. 
And let that sink in when you're thinking about Bible study today. Think about how blessed we are to have Bibles at home, to have the ability to read them every day for ourselves, to have an educational system that allows us to read. Thank you, teacher. Yes. That it lets, lets you read the Bible for yourself. It is a tremendous blessing. And then perhaps the sobering thought of, hmm, what is God going to expect in return for that investment? I'll let you think about that. The other thing that the law is said to do in Deuteronomy 31, speaking of third-party objectivity, the law is actually set outside the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark, you know, is the box. I don't know why it's translated Ark. It's the box, but it's the box that contains Aaron's budding rod and, and the manna, jars of the manna, and the tablets of the Covenant. But in this particular case, Moses has a very precise instruction in Deuteronomy 31. At verse 24, when Moses had finished writing down the words of this law in a book to the very end, Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, take this book of the law and put it by the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God so that it may be there for a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stubborn you are. Behold, even today, while I'm yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? Assemble to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the way that I've commanded you. And in the days to come, evil will befall you, because you'll do what is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger through the work of your hands. These are terrible things. And Moses said, I know this is going to happen. You're already rebellious, and I'm still here. When I leave, it's going to get bad, isn't it? And it did. We, you, if you've read the Bible, you know that was 100% correct. But what did he tell them? Take this book and put it by the side of the ark that it may be there for a witness against you. What does that mean? He's saying, leave it out. Keep it out so that you can see it and so that it can see you. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Not that the stone tablets literally see people. You know what he means. Leave it out so you can see it and it can see you. You are being watched by the word of God. And we all are. We're all being policed by the Bible. It is a third party objective standard. Truth exists. Truth is real. Truth is knowable. And it's outside of you and me. But we are accountable to it. And we measure ourselves against it. Keep it out there so you can see it and it can see you. That's what he told them. And if you were like me, you heard some echoes there in what he was saying. Uh, where Paul is with the elders of Ephesus in Acts 20 and says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. And therefore he commended them to the word of God, the word of his grace. It's very much the same message. He knew that people were rebellious in his time while he was still alive. John knew this. Peter knew this. You can see it in all the writings of the apostles. They were well aware that there were people who bucked their authority, who did not listen to what they said, even though the Holy Spirit spoke through them. And they knew, too, that it would wax worse. 
after their departure. And so they wrote these things down, that we might be able to bring them to mind at any time afterward. It's a different lesson, but those echoes are there. And I think that it's a different lesson in the, in the details only. I think the, the substance there, or the main idea, is the same, which is the word is the standard. The word is the measure. The word is how you know right from wrong, and the word is the thing that you are to hold to and to be dedicated to, not the messenger of that word, however powerful that messenger might be, whether Moses or Paul the Apostle. That messenger is but a messenger, good and faithful men. I don't detract from them. I don't envy them either. <laughs> I don't think I could have been as, as good as they were. But they're just men. The standard is the Bible, the law. Finally, in our consideration, I would turn your attention to Deuteronomy 17. The law settles every matter. The law settles every matter. What we mean by this is, there are not things that are left unresolved. There are not things left unsolved. There are not things that are left up to judgment that don't get judged. The law doesn't make room for that. Oh, there are things that require judgment, and the law knows that, and the law embraces that. But it does so by providing, for example, Deuteronomy 17. Here's what you have to do. In the 18th verse beginning, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 17 in the 8th verse beginning, 17, 8. If any case arises requiring decision between one kind of homicide and another, one kind of legal right and another, one kind of assault and another, any case within your towns that is too difficult for you, then... You shall arise, go up to the place that the Lord your God will choose. You will come to the Levitical priests. Wherever that is, your local yokel priests, that's what this is. And to the judge who is in office in those days. And you shall consult them. And they will declare to you the decision. It was too difficult for you to resolve it on your own, just using the Bible, you can appeal to the Levitical priests and the judge who has been appointed in office at that time in those days. In that place, your local authority. When you consult them, they will declare the decision. Then, you shall do according to what they declare to you from that place that the Lord will choose, and you shall be careful to do according to all that they direct you. According to the instructions that they give you, which is Torah, that's the law. And according to the decision which they pronounce to you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside from the verdict that they declare to you, either to the right hand or to the left, the man who acts presumptuously by not obeying the priest who stands to minister there before the Lord your God or the judge, that man shall die. So you shall purge the evil from Israel, and all the people shall hear and fear and not act presumptuously again. Well, what are we talking about? Well, it's what we said before. The law settles every matter. It's any case that's too difficult for you, you take it to the place that God has appointed, which is to say wherever it is that the priests are working in your local, wherever you are, whatever tribe you are. And you come to the Levitical priests, to the judge who is in office in those days, 
So one of the priests is going to be serving as a judge. And what is his charge? Well, his charge, his charge is the 11th verse. The instructions, the Torah, the law, that's what that is. When you go to that Levitical priest, or you listen to the one who is appointed to take cases at that time, one of the priests, as the judge, they give you the law. Not that their own word is law. They use the law of God to make a decision. The law is used to judge a matter by means of the priest or judge, whatever, that office holder, local. That judge is using the law and handing to the uh, persons who've come together, litigants, if you want to call it that, but the, the persons in this question or dispute of what do we do, how do we resolve it? He hands to them, here is what the law teaches, this is the verdict, this is what you will do. That verdict is reached by means of the use of the law. So it has to be done that way. And there are a lot of interesting examples that you can go to. But for a moment, before we go there, think about this. They're supposed to use the law of God to make those decisions. They are supposed to be familiar with and have access to the law. If perhaps individual members of the community don't have a copy with them, or they cannot read, or they just don't remember. It is the job of the priest to remember. It is the job of the priestly class to be able to read and to consult the law and see what does it say about this? What should we do here? And when that comes back, and the judge renders a judgment, that is binding. According to the instructions they give you, according to the decision they pronounce to you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside from the verdict they declare. If you act presumptuously by not obeying the priest, you die. That's the word of God in this matter. What, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about application of the word of God. The Bible is intended to be understood, to be applied. And those who are working on God's behalf in the faith, who are guided by the Bible, use that Bible to render judgments. And when they do so, that is the judgment. That's the verdict. That's what needs to be done. And to do otherwise is to buck the authority of God not the authority of the office holder. The office holder is not binding his own word or his own think so. He's handing you the law at verse 11. The instructions they give you, that is, they hand you the law, Torah they give you. That is the binding instruction. You've got to follow that. Do we bind the word of God today? See, this is the issue. People do not want the word of God to be bound. They want to stay in between, in the white spaces, in the margin, in between the lines there. But that's not right. There might be times when judgments have to be made. Fair enough. But the judgment has to be made. And the judgment has to be rendered. And that has to be binding. Otherwise, you have disorder and chaos. And it's something that the Lord called evil that should be purged. When persons of faith use the Bible in faith and rely on the scripture, and they use that scripture to reach an agreement, a judgment in the matter, and this is for the purpose of the order in the local congregation, 
That is binding. Yes, that's binding. And if it isn't, then you have chaos. That's something that is called evil that the Lord purges. If you don't do that, it's chaos. You can't have it. It's outside of the law. So take, for example, the elders um, in a local place. Understand that you can read in the letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy, that Timothy is charged to appoint elders, and in the third chapter there are instructions for what you're looking for in a person who's going to be an elder. But the letter starts with, Timothy, I left you there in Ephesus. <laughs> well, you know whether this happened. This is Acts chapter 19, where Paul showed up in Ephesus and he found some people who believed in the Lord, but they only understood up through John's baptism. It was accurate as far as it went, but there was more to learn. And when they learned it, they too obeyed the gospel, became Christians. So now there's a church at Ephesus. And he's there for a time with Timothy. And at the end of chapter 19, he departs Ephesus, leaving Timothy there. That's when, you know, something around that time is when he can send the letter to Timothy saying, I left you at Ephesus, appoint elders as directed. Later in Acts 20, which is only the next chapter over, not 15 years later, maybe 15 months later, maybe, Paul is on his way back on travels, and he's near Ephesus, doesn't actually go there, he stops in Miletus, remember? And in Miletus, he summons to himself the elders of Ephesus. Well, at first there weren't even any Christians there. Now there's a church, and now there's elders. How did that happen? Well, it's 1 Timothy 3. It's 1 Timothy. He said, Timothy, I left you there to put things in order. Appoint elders as directed. And he did. Now the elders at Ephesus can be summoned, and they do come, and they meet Paul. And Paul said, shepherd the flock among you, uh, among which the Holy Spirit made you overseers. That's what he says in Acts 20. Did the Holy Spirit make them overseers, or did Timothy? Yes. Yes. Why did Timothy make them overseers? Well, because he was told to do so. Titus 1, the evangelist appoints the elders. Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas, neither of whom are elders, they're evangelists, traveling back through, appoint elders in every city. That's what they do. That's the word of God. But, did they appoint them? Did Timothy appoint these elders? Well, he did fulfill the commandment to appoint elders, but he did what God said. How does he know what God said? Well, he has a letter from Paul. So did Paul say that, or did God say that? Well, God said that through Paul. So yes, <laughs> Paul said that, and the Holy Spirit said that. When the Holy Spirit gave these words to Paul, and Paul gave these words to Timothy, and Timothy gave these words to the congregation, and they had elders appointed, the Holy Spirit appointed those elders. That's how it works. That's how it always works. You have to use the Bible. You have to apply the Bible. And when you do so, it's the Spirit doing it, not you. Yes, Timothy literally appointed them, but the Holy Spirit appointed them elders because they were appointed according to the words that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's what this in Deuteronomy 17 is saying. You are not sure how to resolve it, so you go to the Levites and the Levites consult the law, the book of God, the Bible, what the Holy Spirit wrote. And they give you that law and that law is binding. That's what you do. That's the meaning. And we have to do it the same way. And in the same way that the Holy Spirit appointed elders in that place, you know, the Holy Spirit would appoint elders in any place if they're going to be appointed 
according to the Bible, that the Holy Spirit has made them overseers. That's what you're striving for. That's what you want. Use the scriptures. Apply the scriptures. All right. Psalm 119, verse 1. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. If you want your way to be blameless, if you want to arrive at the judgment day without surprises and gotchas, you can do so by ordering your life according to the Bible, by being subject to the teachings of the Bible. We're not saying that the evangelist has some special authority. No, there's an order of God for how things have to be done. That's just the way that is. But the authority, if you will, of that office is the word of God. It is binding. It is true. The elders are charged with making choices for the local church, but they are charged with doing so within the confines of the word of God. It is the rule. It is the law. And outside of that, they're overstepping boundaries. Heads of household are to lead their household in the faith, and they should teach their children the word of God. This also is governed by God's word in the same way that the law provided for every case, birth and death, illness and wealth, peace and sin. Everything was provided for in that law. So also the Bible provides for us today. Every case can be met. So you can be right with God. You can know what his will is. You can approve what is excellent. And you can have salvation. Because we have been granted a tremendous law, a tremendous word, and much grace from God who has shown us this kindness. Are we perhaps speaking today and you are not yet subject to the law of God? You are not a Christian. Well, become a Christian. Obtain for yourself forgiveness of sins by repenting in the heart, setting God first from now on, and putting him on in baptism for forgiveness of your sins. The blood of Jesus washes away every sin, and you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, created in him for good works, which God prepared beforehand for us to walk in. If today you have been a Christian but not walking in the things God prepared, repent, Make things right in your heart with God. Pray for forgiveness. But let us pray for you too, because, well, we all need prayers and encouragement. And we can encourage you too. If you believe in Jesus as the Christ and need to put him on in baptism, or if you as a Christian need the prayers of the saints, please let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song Selected.